And I'm very, very happy to be able to introduce the next speaker, whom I remember from many, many, many years ago. And uh, let me just go ahead and tell you a bit about him. Jeff Steely is Dean of Libraries at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. Prior to arriving at Georgia State, uh, Mr. Steely served as Associate Dean and Director of Central Libraries at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. Earlier positions at Baylor included Assistant Dean, Director of Central Libraries, Assistant Director for Client Services, and Outreach Services Librarian. Jeff began his career as the Serials Librarian at the Library of the U.S. Courts in Chicago, Illinois. Jeff is a graduate of Bethel College in Kansas and holds an MLIS from the University of Texas at Austin. He has participated in the Harvard ACRL Leadership Institute and was a 2014 CLIR Educause Leading Change Institute Fellow. Jeff is active in numerous regional and national organizations and served as the 2015-2016 President of the Library Leadership and Management Association. Please give a warm welcome to Jeff Steely. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I have to admit, I'm not sure why you're here. Um, <laughs> I feel a little bit like a flight attendant that needs to announce it. This is the 315 flight to library administration. This is your last chance to exit. Um, of course, that's not true. You could exit at any time, but once we get to 30,000 feet, you will be jumping without a chute. Um, I am, after all, a defector. I left NASIG of my own free will and to the relatively neutral Switzerland of uh, resource sharing and then only to cross the border into library administration uh, about 17 years ago. And I'm not advancing, so we will just use the buttons on the, on the is that going to work? How about page down? Hold on, slight tech delay here. Thank you. So I don't know why you're here, but I know I have an idea why I'm here. It's because um, it, bo it really boils down to this. Um, I spent a few days here, and now I'm here, working here in Atlanta. I was privileged to be one of nine student grant winners for the um, 13th NASIG conference in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, the theme that year, 1998, was Head in the Clouds, Feet on the Ground. And your meeting is here in Atlanta, so I was uh, a cheap, free speaker. <laughs> I'm representing the class of 98, so I want to tell you a little bit about that class. Um, any one of them, I'd like to give them a shout out because any one of them could have been up here today. Um, I wasn't able to track down what all of them are doing today, but from doing some digging, I found that we have um, several who you may recognize here because they've been active in the areas of collection development, digital resources, access, and discovery. Um, we have at least one uh, reference library in a public library. We have an academic department head. We have an assistant dean at a research university. Uh, one's been involved in library education, and another is a media specialist at an elementary school. So I, I was asked here to talk about my career path from being a NASIG serials librarian in good standing to my current role as a dean. And I don't want to spend 45 minutes talking about me, so here's my plan. I will tell a little bit about my, how I became a librarian story and what's happened since then. I'm going to reflect a little bit on what happened at Boulder 20 years ago. I'll share a few lessons I've learned along the way. I want to have a brief comment on where I think we're headed and what we can do about it. And then I do hope there's some time for some questions and, and uh, comments that you might have. 
As I thought about my path into librarianship, um, it, I, I, I mentioned we had a school media li librarian um, in our 98 cohort. It could have been my school media librarian that first planted that seed, uh, Irvella braun louis or fortunately we were able to call her just Miss B. Um, she uh, unfortunately passed a few, a few years ago, but I did see a, a, another student at our elementary school who had commented about what a wonderful librarian, her gentle voice, um, her approach to storytelling and her love for books. Um, had great experiences at the public library in my hometown, had a high school librarian who was the coach for our college bowl team and created an environment in the library that was kind of a good place for the nerds to hang out. Um, but to, lest I give you the wrong impression, I didn't come out of my childhood with intentions of becoming a librarian. I stumbled into it like I suppose, uh, I expect a number of you probably did too. Um, up until I was five, I was going to be a CPA like dad and then I thought better of that. Um, and at some point along the way, I thought about architecture. I went to college to become a chemist. Um, and along the way, ended up with a bachelor's degree in history and religion. And what are you going to do with that? Um, so um, graduated from college, was married, had one daughter. Another one would come later. And um, a spouse with a very clear career direction. And me not so much, and so we moved around the country taking turns going to school, for advancing her career, and searching for mine. And we spent a couple years in Cleveland, a year in Elkhart, Indiana, where I went to seminary to avoid becoming a pastor, that's a, uh, not what you always hear. Um, spent a few years in Jacksonville, Florida. I was on the phone last night with my wife and my younger daughter, who's now 26, and she said, oh, so you're gonna talk about Jacksonville I said, no, I'm just going to have a picture. Well, I lied. I'll, I'll, I'll say something about Jacksonville. Um, still searching for what I was going to do. Um, I was mostly a stay-at-home dad with that 26-year-old who was then a baby and um, doing all kinds of odd jobs uh, while my wife was full-time with the Jacksonville Symphony. Uh, that included um, being a customer service representative, helping people make jams and jellies, um, and uh, bussing tables at a professional golf tournament. At the very end of that time there, I was throwing an apartment newspaper route, and I also said, well, maybe I want to teach high school, and so I was working on teacher certification. Um, that last summer we were in Jacksonville, I took 15 hours, mostly in a six-week period. And um, then my wife, an opportunity opened up for my wife at Baylor University, which unfortunately Waco at the time was known for an event that had happened about a year before, um, and people said, you're going where? Um, it, this was long before Waco became this um, unexplainable tourist phenomenon that it is today. Um, well, the first job I got when we moved to Waco was, again, throwing papers. This time I was driving 100 miles every night out in the country and decided that probably wasn't a real career for me, so kept looking and landed a part-time temporary reference assistant position at Baylor. Um, and it only took me weeks, maybe days, to realize, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing and where I first developed a passion for being a librarian. So I got a full-time position that summer um, as a serials clerk in the acquisitions department, checking in serials beginning with letters A through I. And um, it was a great job. And part, one of the things that was great about it was even though it was a full-time position, it was really about a half-time job. And so um, it gave me an opportunity to spread my wings, to try new things. I unfortunately had a boss who allowed me to do that, allowed me the flexibility to try things. Um, I worked diligently to fill in the gaps in our back files. Um, I did an inventory of our whole, to fix our holding statements. I improved our claims process. One of the accomplishments I'm really proud of is I got my colleagues to move from doing um, word processing on mass, using Mass 11 on the VAX to using the PCs that were sitting right in front of us. Um, but the big project that I worked on toward the end of my time there was a migration. We were doing serials check-in on a standalone product called Microlinks from EBSCO. Um, anybody remember or use Microlinks? Probably not. Um, so we were, oh, Steve did. Okay, so we were migrating from uh, Microlinks uh, to the Innovative uh, Interfaces serials module, and I led a small team um, that did that project. So during this time, um, I started, while I was working full-time at Baylor, I also started commuting to Austin to get my library degree at the University of Texas. And over the next two years, I would drive that 100-mile trip each way. A couple times a week, I once calculated I drove about 30,000 miles to get my master's degree. And as I was wrapping up my time at UT, 
I won this student grant to come to the NASIG conference, which is, I think, my first sort of big kids conference, my first, at least first or second time away to go to a professional conference. So in preparing for today, I reflected on that experience. I looked at the proceedings and at some of the newsletters from back then. It was fun thinking about um, the experience that we had. Uh, we went to Celestial Seasonings for an event. Um, we had a dinner at the National Center for Atmospheric Research that you see here. I looked at the list of attendees from that conference, and what was really interesting to me was there were at least a dozen names in that list of people that I would have significant interaction with later in my career, three of whom I would say had a significant impact on my professional work. I remembered a number of the sessions. There was one on automation system migration, which was very relevant to what I was working on. Um, there was one on Edifact that I'm sure I was at because that was the nerdy kind of person that I was. Um, and there was, one, there was one presentation that I didn't have to look at the, the proceedings to be reminded of because I had quoted from this talk numerous times. Uh, Janet Swan Hill had given a humorous talk title of which was, you may already know the answer. And what's, what's, I have referenced numerous times, she said that another, quoting another individual, Arnold said that if you follow an on-standard practice someday, someone somewhere will curse your name. Her corollary to that was, if you follow a substandard practice someday, somewhere, someone somewhere will curse your name, and if you stay long enough at your present job, it's going to be you. I've brought that up a number of times where there's been an easy path and there's been the right path and to help keep us, keep us on the right path. So shortly after the conference, I finished my degree at University of Texas at Austin and my wife by that time was in a tenure track position at Baylor and had to get her doctorate in order to achieve tenure. And so with two kids and a dog uh, and no job, uh, we moved to Chicago and that's where I landed uh, my uh, next position as the um, only serials librarian in the U.S. Courts Library. Um, the U.S. Courts was going through a process of migrating from Cardex cards for serials check-in to uh, Circe Unicorn serials module. Um, my, my real job turned out to be beta tester for the serials module because it was new and we had complex publications and a lot of them and so I was on the phone with, with Circe a lot in those days. Well, this is the time when um, I left NASIG behind, I'm sorry to say, um, had an opportunity uh, that opened up at Baylor to go back and, and uh, got a professional position. Outreach Services Library means head of resource sharing. Um, and um, it was a great opportunity for me um, and then over the, the following years um, kind of worked my way up. One of the things that's interesting here was that each of these, until I became a dean uh, in 2015, each of these was a, essentially a new position. Um, and so there, usually I could kind of write the job description myself. At the same time, during, during the middle part of this period at Baylor, um, I did work on an ed-D, again, at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, for three years, I was a full-time administrator and a full-time graduate student and uh, finished my coursework, did my qualifying exams, worked on my treatise, and then kind of flamed out. Um, I was exhausted. Um, I, I, Calculator. I probably drove about 60,000 miles working on that degree. So between the library degree and my work toward an ed-D, I've made approximately three and a half revolutions around the earth between Waco and Austin. Um, toward the end of my time at Baylor, I was looking for opportunities uh, to advance. I was ready to try something new. The, the, the role I had as associate dean was, was kind of unique because we had a merged library IT organization there and the, the deans had come from the IT side, and so uh, during my time as associate dean, I got to play dean, I got to go represent the university uh, to external organizations, and that was a real um, growth experience for me. So during, during those latter years, I, I did a number of interviews and had a couple of close calls, and I had uh, an interview uh, for a dean position early in 2015, and was a finalist there, didn't get the position, and then a little bit later, the search committee the same search firm called me up and said, well, would you be interested in Georgia State? I didn't know much about GSU at the time. Uh, I had talked to one of my now associate deans just a couple months before about the um, uh, display wall that he put up. We were thinking about doing sim something similar, but didn't know a lot about Georgia State. Interviewed, landed the job, and couldn't be happier to be here. One of the benefits of being a dean is you get to brag about your institution. You get to, and I, I'd like you to know a little bit about Georgia State and why this is kind of the reward at the end of this list. 
um, why it's, it's so exciting to be in this role and to be at this institution. Georgia State is the uni largest university in the state of Georgia with about 52,000 students. We have about 32,000 students associated with our downtown campus. And about a couple years ago, um, we went through a process that happens frequently in the, in the university system of Georgia, which is a consolidation. And uh, Georgia Perimeter College was an open access two-year institution with five campuses that became a college, Perimeter College, within Georgia State. So we're the largest university in Georgia. We're also known as the fourth most innovative university in the country. Um, and um, part of the reason for that is what we've done in the area of student success. Uh, Bill Gates was in our library last October. The reason was he wanted to hear from our VP for student success about the things that were happening at Georgia State. About 10 years ago, we were a typical urban serving public institution with a six year graduation rate that was in the low 30s. Um, and the institution did some self-reflection and said, what if the problem is us and what we're, how we're setting our students up to fail? And since that time, has really worked to innovate around um, helping our students be successful. Over the last 10 years, the number of students from uh, Pell eligible students, the number of minority students, the number of first generation students has grown. And what you would expect based on that is that our enrollment rate would have fallen. But in fact, it's gone up 22%. And what's more remarkable is that those three groups that have traditionally struggled in our universities are graduating at the same rate at Georgia State as the institution as a whole. We graduate more African Americans every year than any other not-for-profit college or university in the country. And so it's great to be in this role at this place. We have a remarkably diverse and active student body and a really active library. At the same time that we've had the student success, we've also really grown in terms of our, our research. You can see the increase that's happened just over the last few years in external funding. It's, the library is an exciting place. This is the, what I called uh, my now associate dean, Brian Sinclair, to ask about was I knew he had been instrumental in designing the curve collaborative university research and visualization environment. It's a great workspace. It's a lab for students to work with big images, big data, um, and it's been, inf we've had dozens if not hundreds of colleges, universities, and corporations come and look at it. And with changes happen around the building, we're gonna need a new entrance, and so we've been working on a plan for that and have big plans for the future. I say that because if you're interested in a job, we're gonna have opportunities in this area, and I would love to talk to you. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, share a few things from my um, leadership bookshelf. I'll have some pictures, but some of the books are only on my Kindle, and I just didn't photo very well, so I'll just talk about them here. Um, one of the sessions at that 1998 NASIG uh, conference was lead from wherever you are. And I've really taken that to heart. That's been something that I've thought about. As I've looked at, um, as I said before, each of the positions that I've been in, I've been sort of the first person in that job up until my current role. And I think there's an advantage to that in that you really um, have to grow the position and think about it. Um, one thing that I um, have found valuable is making sure that I'm not thinking just about my job, but I'm thinking one or two rungs up the, up the hierarchy. Um, I've, I've had the privilege of um, uh, being in the Library Leadership and Management Association mentor program. And this is one of the things I make sure that I always talk about is if you're looking to be a leader, um, one, of the, one of the signs of that is somebody that sees the big picture, that understands the needs of the organization. Um, I, I think that my first really big promotion going from head of resource sharing to that assistant director for client or public services was because I sent an email to the brand new dean who I didn't think we had, should have selected because he didn't have the credentials. Um, and I, but, but that was not, it was an email talking about opportunities I saw for the library things that were, be, that were kind of outside the scope of my job, but they really didn't fall into anybody's position. And I think that is what helped um, me to advance into that position. Um, one, of the, one of the books not pictured here that's been very influential for me is um, The Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge. Um, and the basic premise of the, one of the basic ideas in there, this fifth discipline is systems thinking. It's seeing the big picture, understanding the complexity of the relationship between cause and effect in most of the things that we do. Um, I was at a hotel recently and the, the handle for the shower was way over here and the shower head was over here, so there's a long pipe in between. And if you 
adjust the temperature, you're not going to feel the change right away. So you might adjust it a little hotter, and then a little, and all of a sudden it's too hot, and so then you crank it back. If you don't account for that delay in the system, um, then you're, you're going to waste a lot of water and a lot of try, time trying to understand the change dynamics that are happening. Same thing in our libraries. We need to understand that when cause and effect aren't always tightly bound, and there can be countervailing forces that kick in, looking at the big picture is really important. This is a, a one of the things, one of the lessons of the fifth discipline. Another book that's been very useful and used in a couple of settings is Reframing Organizations by Bowman and Deal. And their basic um, premise is that we all have sort of tendencies. We, ha we all have tendencies. We have of certain ways that we want to attack a problem. Um, there's a little test that you can do. And early on in my career, I was clearly in the structural frame. I was all about getting the org chart right, um, getting the right um, policies in place and kind of missing the other frame. So the idea with reframing is that look at a problem from multiple angles. The other frames that they talk about are the political frame. That was something that I started using a lot more later in my career as I was managing up and I was working on negotiating things. There's the symbolic frame, standing up in front of a group and saying the right things, um, using metaphors, getting, helping people get the big picture. And then the human, resource or human resources frame, making sure we're not forgetting about the people that are with us and what their needs are. One other book that's really been influential for me in terms of thinking about leading is Susan Cain's book, Quiet. Um, I love the subtitle, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Um, I, I suspect there may be other introverts in the room like me. Um, and one, one of the things from, I got from reading Quiet was uh, an affirmation that there is a place for introverts in leadership, that there are strengths that we bring um, to, uh, to an organization. It also helped me very practically as I was dealing with a colleague who was kind of my opposite, opposite very extroverted, and couldn't understand, why is it that you always want me to make a phone call when I, I think an email would work better and I can really go into detail and really explain my thinking? Um, why is it that you always want to meet and figure things out face to face? Reading, reading Quiet helped me understand it's because of her, she's an extrovert, that is the air, that is how she sees the world and how she works most effectively. It helped me negotiate that relationship a lot better. So I'm assuming some of you are here because you're interested in growing into leadership roles or you have leadership roles and you're looking for nuggets, looking for ideas. Um, one book that I've read recently that it's a fairly simple book, but I, it was helpful for me in understanding people um, is Mindset. Uh, Carol Dweck, this emerges out of her research on how people deal with failure. And she was surprised when people were failing to see that there were these two camps. She understood the one, because she kind of came out of a fixed mentality, that if I don't do well, if I fail at a test, if, I, um, if, if, uh, if I'm not succeeding, it's because of my limits. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not that good. I sort of, it's a fixed mentality about ability versus a growth mindset that assumes that a failure is a learning opportunity. I didn't do well in that test, so I'm gonna figure out what went wrong, I'm, I'm gonna do better. So certainly for leadership, having a growth mindset is, is essential. It provides uh, resilience. Um, it helps you to respond when things don't go well in a constructive way, in a way that you can move forward and you can build on, whether you're seeking your, your, your next position or when you're in that, le that leadership position and you, as you inevitably will, make a huge mistake. Another uh, time when you need resilience is when you're trying to get that next position, when you're interviewing or when you're working on that. And here I just want to drop in a couple of tips from interview experiences I've had on both sides of the table. Um, one from interviewing people, one of the things I've noticed in a number of candidates is um, that the candidates haven't done adequate research about the institution or the job that they're interviewing for. And that's always disappointing. Um, it, it makes us wonder how seriously are you taking us? Um, how interested are you in the position? Um, at the very least, um, scour the website, understand the institution, understand the role. One of the things I like to do when I'm going into an interview is to 
research all of the members of the search committee, or maybe all of them, all the people that I'm scheduled to meet with during the day, see if I can find a picture, see if I can find a brief bio, understand their background, their research interests, that sort of thing. I don't memorize all that. My memory's not that good. Um, but it does help me have a comfort going in and an understanding of who I'm going to be talking to and what to expect. Another thing that I found very helpful when I'm being interviewed is having a cheat sheet. Um, there, there are lots of lists out there where you can find, find typical interview questions. And it's obviously good practice to think about that ahead of time, to rehearse some responses. One of the things that I've just built over time, it just grows, is a list of examples. Your, your answers are going to be a lot more effective if you can point to a specific example. Sometimes it can be tricky because you don't want to name names, you don't want to throw somebody under the bus, but if you can work through that and have those examples, when was the time that an employee really disappointed you and how did you respond? Well, for me, I can put somebody's initials, I can put YZ there. I, I remember who that was, what the situation was. I can rehearse that, rehearse talking about that in a way that I don't reveal who YZ is, but it shows that I understand the problem and a way of resolving it. So when you are successful in that interview and you land, you step up uh, to a new position, one of the things you'll figure out very quickly, particularly I think if you're, you're moving to a new institution, is that all of a sudden everything you say carries a different weight and words you say take on new meanings you never knew they had. Um, and so one, piece, one of the things that's helpful going into a position is to make sure that you're kind of geared up to hit the ground running to be productive in your first, uh, first days there. Um, one book that I found useful in preparing um, for a move was First 90 Days by Michael Watkins. Um, and basically, it's, it's just to have a roadmap, to have a plan. How are you going to identify the issues? How are you going to make progress? How are you going to be successful in your communications in your first 90 days? Another thing about uh, being successful in a leadership role, I think it's critical that you do what you say you're going to do, and that you do it in a timely way, that you're reliable. Um, that's where one of the books I added here to the bookshelf, um, David Allen's Getting Things Done. It's not a new book. It's, it's kind of uh, dated in terms of how it's, uh, there may be a new edition that's more up to date with, it's still sort of in a paper world. But a lot of really great ideas about how to organize information, how to make decisions about, uh, and how to like, get your inbox down to zero, how to file information so that it's there but it's not weighing you down. I don't always succeed at GTD, but um, it's always something that I'm striving for uh, because I think it helps me be a reliable partner to the team that I work with. A book I'm reading right now, um, so I'm about halfway through, and so far I can really recommend it. It's called Mind of the Leader. It's by Hugard and Carter. Um, one of my takeaways from the book is that it's really important to take care of yourself so you can take care of your team. Sometimes being a leadership role can be stressful, it can be overwhelming, dealing with lots of information, unexpected challenges, and um, that, can, that can overwhelm you. It can be, it can be lonely at times. Um, but the one takeaway I had here in terms of taking care of yourself, they say to understand for yourself what are the things that cause your highs and cause your lows. So la last week I had a chance to give a presentation, kind of, for me it was high stakes presentation to our foundation board. And so the president was gonna be there, the senior VP for the, 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 the development board is gonna be there, my dean colleagues were gonna be there. Um, so a little bit of pressure. And so when the, the president, in some summative remarks, commented on one of my slides and commented on alignment between what we were doing and what the university is doing, that's the kind of thing that gives me a buzz, and so I know that. Um, what are the things that cause the lows? Early on in my time here, um, I was following a process, and I stepped into it deep. Um, I really didn't think about the people part of it very well, and I hurt somebody's feelings. And I just felt terrible about that. Well, if I understand those things about myself, what are the things that really make me feel great, really or make me feel awful? The book recommends trying to not let your, pendulum, your emotional pendulum swing all the way out there, keeping your emotions a little more, under, recognizing what's happening, keeping those emotions 
And so you can control your own emotions a little better so that it allows you to listen to your team and to have the emotional intelligence to read the signs, to hear what your team members are saying. One of the things about being in a leadership position is sometimes you have the opportuni opportunity to build the team around you. And this is where diversity is really important. Des diversity of experience, diversity of perspective, and diversity of, of strengths on your team. So another book that sh on my shelf is Strengths Finder. I've used this in a variety of settings. It comes out of the Gallup organization and has a, lists about 40 strengths. And there's a test you take and um, you, you, it identifies your top five strengths. And I've, I've used this in a variety of settings. I've used this in a department where there's a communication problem to help them talk to each other and understand the differences in the group. Um, I've used this for an individual to help sort of steer toward a career path that maybe fit their strengths a little better. I've used it personally to understand myself. I've used it to understand my team. Um, so if you're in a leadership role, one of the things that you can do is um, build a team around your, th that complements your strengths. The basic premise of Strengths Finder is that we're going to be more successful if we build on our strengths rather than worry about fixing our weaknesses. Because one of the ways you can fix your weaknesses is by having people with strengths in those areas. And for those of you that have done Strength Finder, I've done this several times. There's been good overlap. The last time I took this, I was futuristic, strategic, learner, responsibility, and relater. Now, for the, the old cataloger in me, the lack of parallelism in the made-up words drive me crazy, but otherwise I think it's a really, really useful instrument. I said I wanted to comment some on where I think we're headed and what we can do about it. Um, one of the conversations we're having a lot at my university now among administration is how do we become a, how to become a university that's prepared for the tsunami that is artificial intelligence and big data and what it's going to mean? How do we prepare our students for that world in which a lot of jobs that we would have prepared them for in the past are going to go away? Um, I would venture to say that there are people in this room who have jobs that really won't exist in a form that's recognizable in five years. Um, artificial intelligence, big data is making big changes in the way the world works. And so I think we have an obligation to future-proof our organizations. And I want you, I want me to be able to future-proof our careers. Um, So one, one other, so one other book I added to the shelf here that's, I've, I found useful in thinking about the library of the future is Stephen Johnson's Where Good Ideas Come From. And Johnson's basic premise is that good ideas, new, new, new ideas don't come out of thin air, but they're accumulation of parts that already exist that are brought together when people with different perspectives are, are brought together. He talks about creating a platform for innovation. He talks about cities as one example. Why is there so much innovation that happens in cities? Well, it's, you've got a lot of diverse people, different backgrounds, different ideas, where they, you can't help but run into each other because of the density of the city, and that's a platform where innovation happens. I think the, the library, speaking for myself for the research library, needs to be a platform where we're bringing together people with different perspectives and allowing those differences to collide. Johnson says that's where the real sparks of innovation fly. One of the things that I encourage uh, librarians when I'm talking to the librarians to think about is not to think about ourselves in terms of our job title, but to think of ourselves as information strategists. As this world changes, as the information and data landscape changes, as the research enterprise evolves, what are the cracks that are appearing? What are the gaps? What are the opportunities? And are we uniquely suited with our background, with our training, with our expertise to fill some of those gaps? This is a way that we can um, also future-proof our organizations and ourselves. You may have heard of the idea of the T-shaped professional. The design firm IDEO uses this. Um, I think IBM has been very um, in influential in using this idea. And it's the idea that 
Um, the problems that we face are big, are complicated problems, and we need a lot of perspectives. We need those kind of collisions to happen. So if we're hiring people that are just kind of I-shaped, that are very focused in a discipline, they have a lot of skills in one area, that's not going to be sufficient. The T-shape is we need also people that at the, who are at the same time collaborative, open to working with others. I heard a presentation a couple years ago from an academic who's both a scientist and an artist, and he talked about the H-shape professional, which of course he was, because um, he has strength in a couple of areas, and his work then is kind of inherently interdisciplinary. Um, last summer, I ran across a post by an Australian researcher who talked about the key-shaped professional. She said in her experience, looking particularly at people in creative industries, that having just one or two areas of expertise is rarely enough to be very successful. That she's found the people that are most successful have those areas of depth, but thinking of a, the teeth on a key, they also have other strengths they've developed and areas that they're dabbling in. For me, what I see there is I see evidence of somebody with an orientation toward um, continuous growth, that growth mindset. Um, we were doing a search recently for a position, a position that I, I think is likely to be wiped away by artificial intelligence in the next five to 10 years. But we're hiring a faculty member, so we're making some sort of a long-term commitment here in this, in this hire. So one of the filters that I applied in that search process for myself as I was thinking about it is which of these candidates has the most evidence of a key shape in, in terms of the work they've done, the way they talk, the way they answer questions, which ones have the broadest perspective and are most likely to be able to evolve um, quickly as the landscape around them changes. So, it's scary where we're headed, um, but I think there are ways that we can work together, that we can really think about what the opportunities are. I'll, I'll give an example of how we're doing, I think, organizationally and how individuals have done this, individuals have done this in our shop. Um, these, this is a list of some of the positions that we've created in the last couple years. Um, and I would venture to say, with maybe the exception of the last one, none of these were job titles that existed 20 years ago when I started in the field, probably not even 10 years ago. I know some of them didn't exist more than about a year ago because we made them up. Um, but we made them up for a reason. It's because we had identified some of those gaps in the information infrastructure of our institution. And we were, we were actually in the process of interviewing for a research data services team leader. Um, we ended up hiring Man, having Mandy here, who was already on our team, um, take that role. She's evolved in her career. She has a, a library degree and a PhD in sociology, and she's grown in her role. She's seen this gap in supporting qualitative research, and so, so she is a campus expert on InVivo. Um, but in the process of this search, we realized we really don't have anybody that has strength in quantitative tools, and we're hearing from students that they need help with Stata, and with SAS, and it's like, okay, let's make up a new job. So we made up the quantitative data specialist for the social sciences. And June 1st, um, our Rada started. She's our new quant person. She has a PhD in sociology. She doesn't have a library background, but she's a librarian now with us, PhD in sociology, um, and has expertise working with Stata and SAS. And incidentally, gave the best job talk that I've ever heard in my career. So these are positions that we're creating as we see those gaps emerge so that we remain relevant on our organization. And you see examples in here of some people who have taken their careers, particularly that example of Mandy, have also future-proofed their careers by continuing to evolve as new needs have emerged. So those are my photo credits that I'm sure you can't see. Um, I hope you, you've had a great experience here in Atlanta. It is a great city, and as I said, we have some opportunities at Georgia State coming up. I'd be happy to talk to you about. Um, while you're in town or on your way to the airport tomorrow, uh, we'd be happy for you to drop in and take a look at, our, at the university library. Um, it's an easy walk from the Five Point Station downtown, a couple blocks north, a couple blocks east. If you get to all the construction where the bridge has recently been torn apart, you've just stepped a few steps too far, because that's right next to us. Um, but we'd be happy to have you come in. I'll make sure the security guards know that they could expect some librarians with luggage, so maybe you can leave your luggage there at the desk. Um, do bring a, a government-issued photo ID, because that's going to be required for visitor access. That's all I had, and now I would be happy to have discussion and take any questions you might have.
Uh, Jeff, my name is Jeff also. I started off as a serious librarian. I am also a library dean right now. Uh, I thought we were brethren until I saw your student enrollment numbers, which are slightly larger than mine. <laughs> but I'd like you to talk about things that, in your role as a dean, draw you outside of the library university-wide, some of those responsibilities. Um, I, th I think that's part of what makes the job uh, a lot of fun, exciting. Um, we are, you know, I, I sit on the Council of Deans and um, I actually had the provost ask me the other day, she said, you know, I hope you don't find these, these conversations, were un, you know, I hope they're worthwhile. I said, absolutely. I don't always speak up. Part of that's the introvert in me, taking in all the information and figuring I will, I will have a, a more meaty response later. But it's also, you know, there's certainly, there are topics, things that are happening at the university that we need to know about to be able to respond to. Um, the er I talked about um, data analytics. Um, the university puts its money where its mouth is in terms of data analytics. Part of the way we've had all that success with our, with our student population is it's been through innovation. We are um, very active in terms of using data analytics to uh, understand where students might go astray and, and, and run a report every night against 800 data points and then uh, advisors will reach out to students. Um, but we're also really thinking about it in the context of um, what are programs we need to create for the future. And so our uh, business, the Robinson College of Business has created this Institute for Insight, which is about doing, it, right now it's master's level projects, very intensive projects in the area of um, big data. And they're hiring in also unexpected faculty members, an electrical engineer in, in the business school, that sort of thing. Um, and now it's starting to go into the other colleges. Uh, for example, um, the, we're going to have a new legal analytics um, program. Uh, that's a partnership between the law school and the business school. And so being in those larger conversations is really important because it allows me to know that I'm on the right track when I propose, when we put together this quantitative data specialist, um, that we are um, at the table having those conversations. Um, another area where I get out of the library, um, and this is part of it's taking the library out, is I think in the past our, our libraries had a fairly um, insular or sort of self-focused approach where we've really focused on our students, faculty, and staff and haven't necessarily seen a, ourselves as a community asset. Um, and um, this is where our, our colleagues that are part of the organization at Perimeter College are, I think, leading us and helping us is they've always been more involved, I think, in, in the community. So we have a, a booth at the Decatur Book Festival every, every Labor Day. Um, that gives us a chance to interact with the public. We've expanded our visitor hours. Um, we're, we're promoting our special collections more broadly. We're doing a number of things to be really seen as a resource for the Atlanta area. Um, one other area that certainly um, I, I kind of alluded to that takes a lot of my attention and is kind of an unexpected pleasure in the job. Um, at one point, I really feared the idea of doing development work, um, that idea of talking to people about money. And then when I realized that it's really about building relationships um, and, and, and that I really started to enjoy doing that work. So that's something certainly that takes me out of the library. Um, this week, it took me to the, the foundation board retreat, um, but it, it takes me to meet alumni, meet potential donors, um, and develop relationships with people in the community. So those, those are some of the things about um, being out, getting out of the library that I find most meaningful about the role. Hello, Jeff. That's kind of a long walk. <laughs> um, as somebody who is really passionate about uh, this organization, NASIG, and uh, hearing your experience, uh, thank you for sharing your experience. How do you think, or what advice do you think would be helpful for us to foster leadership in our profession as an organization? That's kind of a tough question, but I thought I'd throw it at you. Okay. Um, that is a very good question. Um, certainly, I think within the organization, just providing those opportunities for people to uh, develop new skills. Um, 
I mentioned that I've had a number of llama mentees that I think I probably get a lot more out of the relationship than they do. Um, but one of the things I'm always interested in exploring, because usually the folks that sign up for that are people that are um, interested in um, moving into a more of a leadership role or developing their leadership skills. And one of the things that I, I really like to talk with them about is to think about where you want to go and um, identify those gaps. And I think that um, for an organization, it's important um, for members to communicate to leadership and for leadership to ask members, what are, what are the gaps that we have in terms of preparing you for, uh, for a leadership role? Um, for the individuals, you know, folks that I've talked to, um, you know, it's, I can think of one, one person that I've been kind of an informal mentor to, and um, at one point their position didn't have any faculty reporting to them. They had a, a, a fairly significant team of staff, but un, the person understood that um, it, in most, um, in, in, in an institution where librarians are faculty, or um, really any academic institution where um, you have librarians and you have staff, um, I don't always like to, I like to play down that difference. I don't think it's a significant, it should be a significant difference. But there, there are differences, and there are, di there are certainly going to be differences in terms of how a search committee looks at your experience if you've only dealt with things in, a, a, dealt with a certain type of personnel, so if you've only dealt with staff. And so my advice to, to, to this person was um, look for opportunities to um, develop uh, to teams that you can lead or places where you can be in a responsible position working with other faculty. And if there's an opportunity as your organization is evolving for bringing faculty onto your team in some way, I knew her, I knew her, her dean, I knew that they were, there's a lot of change and there might be a chance. Um, that's, you know, one, essentially that's a gap in your, in your resume that you need to fill. For, for a lot of folks that are um, interested in moving into an associate dean or a dean role, the development piece is going to be a gap. Um, and so for an organization, I, it's, it's, it's hard for me to think what exactly that might look like, because but for the individual, I think it's important to see that gap and then just to look for opportunities. So I think that's the most important thing the organization can do is to provide opportunities, meaningful opportunities for people to step up and develop those leadership skills to be able to get that list of stories that you can tell um, when you're in that interview. Um, being able to translate, you may not have experience um, supervising faculty in your workplace, but talk about the, the NASIG committee that you were chair of and the group of people that you worked with there and how, you know, you can, you can translate that experience um, into a, a parallel to what they're looking for. Hello, Mr. Steely. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, he will always be Mr. Steely to me. Um, we, I'm actually friends with his daughter. So um, I'm curious about how you handle work-life balance. So one of the things that I've noticed at the different institutions that I've worked is that um, the directors or the bosses or the supervisors are always there, and they're always present, and they're always on call. And so I was curious, as someone who's a, you know, a dreaded millennial, um, how would you balance that? Sure. I, I think work-life balance is tremendously important. Um, another a book that I, I probably should have had on my shelf there um, is Daniel Pink's book, Drive. It talks about what motivates people in the workplace. Um, it talks about how these sorts of um, merit pay evaluation systems most of us have are inherently demotivating and a bad idea that we're you know, kind of stuck with. Uh, and need to make the best of. Um, so I think, I think work-life balance is tremendously important. Um, there's, there's some data out there that shows once you get past working 40 or 45 hours a week, your productivity plummets. Um, I um, try to balance my time. Now, when I have presentations to prepare, um, uh, especially when I have two in a week, um, the, the work-life balance kind of goes out the window. Um, but for me, work-life balance is really important, and I think it's really important for my team. Um, one thing is, is people in leadership roles need to set an example. 
Um, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I am that person that's in the office all the time, that I'm responding to every question, uh, that any crisis that comes up, I'm the first one there. Well, then one, I'm, I'm communicating to other people that that's my expectation for them. Um, and two, um, I'm not demonstrating a lot of faith in the team that I have that they're able to take care of their responsibilities themselves. Um, one, thing that, one thing that I've tried to do lately, I, I, I think I read an, read an article recently and it was talking about um, just some of our practices around email and communication and the expect, ex expectations we set up. Um, for a while I worked for someone who would send emails all hours, day and night. I, I think this person must have slept about three hours a night. And um, I got into a bad routine for a while. I was actually taking classes and so I was on my computer late in the evening and I would see an email come in and I would respond. And then there would be a response right away and then it's a conversation. And um, it's, it's creating this expectation between us that we're gonna be available all the time and we're gonna, and, uh, so I, I pretty quickly figured out after 9 p.m. I do not respond. Um, but this article I read recently uh, was talking about let's, let's help communicate our value in, of work-life balance by not sending emails over the, week, uh, over the weekend. Um, it doesn't mean you can't write them. It doesn't mean that you, you can't get caught up on Saturday. It means schedule it to go out Monday morning. So again, you're, un unless it's really something's burning down and you need to get a hold of somebody, just schedule that email so that it goes out Monday morning. Um, it looks like you're really productive when you get to the office. Um, but it also, it values the time of, of, your, of your team such that they know that you, 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 you value their, their work-life balance. Um, yeah. Good afternoon. Hi. I would like to know if, um, as a relatively new dean, um, and someone who is interested in leadership, if you have set up any kind of um, library leadership mentoring program in your library. And if you haven't, have you thought about doing that? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and we have not set up anything formal. Um, one of the things that we did this last year is, um, well, before that, shortly after I got there, we went through a strategic planning process and developed our list of six strategic areas that we were going to work in. Um, probably too long of a list, but that's how it kind of boiled up. But one, one of the things that came up over that process and is one of our um, strategic areas, but that didn't have a lot of meat to it because it did evolve as we went through this, was about um, culture, workplace culture. And so this last year, we formed a workplace culture task force. And um, they, they did a survey. We got sort of a, uh, a measure of kind of how people feel about the culture right now and, and some good ideas for how to evolve that. And there certainly within that was, um, there were some good suggestions for how we might help um, people that are in leadership roles to evolve. Very few of us, I think, had, I will say, I did not have meaningful leadership training as a library school student. And I think with all of the retirements that are happening, there are lots of opportunities. I hear from a recruiter at least once a month about a dean level position that's open. Do I know anybody that's looking that would be interested that might be a fit? Um, and I know that there are, are you know, sort of dominoes of positions across organizations that are opening up because there are so many retirements happening right now. And so I think it's, it is really critical that um, our library school programs and our professional development organizations and, 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 and our libraries are really working to build those skills. So that was you know, some of the recommendations that came out of that report um, were around um, we have department heads that have this challenge or um, we need to work on communication. And so we certainly have, I think, the building blocks for doing that that we haven't set it up yet. Thanks. Looks like there are no more questions. So with that, I just want to say thank you for your time. I hope that you found some of this valuable. I've certainly enjoyed being here.